Hi there, welcome to Director's Debrief, episode 22. We have Jamie with us. The story of Jamie is, is long, fun. Um, you don't look nervous. It's, it's, it's fun. It's great. Well, you joined us in the summer of 2019 as right. an intern. Yep. Um, went back to university very selfishly to continue doing your degree mm -hmm. that you've been working on for so long. Yep. And then um, you graduated university yep. and you came to join us. Work. There's, there's a lot of nuances here, but you came to join us. You worked with us for how long? Eight to nine months. Eight to nine months. Um, and then you said you would not go anywhere until your dream called. And yeah. uh, your dream called. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you said you wouldn't go anywhere unless, yes. not until. You weren't waiting for it. Yeah, yeah. And how dare your dream call? And how <laughs> dare your dreams come true? Uh, it um, was, yeah. yeah. That was, an, it, it was like I'd finally, like, found, like, something, like, like I was happy, like, I was very happy here. Mm. And then, like, we'd had my probation review. Yes. And then I got home that afternoon telling my mum about the probation review, or how well it went. Mm. And then I got an email about the interview <laughs> for the job that I'm now at. Yeah. And you were just like, I just want to, can I say this? Mm -hmm. I just want to interview because I want to know if I've got what it takes. Yeah. Do you remember this? Said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just want to know if I've got what it takes to make it at this level. Mm. Um, and then one day you said, I need to talk to you, Sam. And I was like, they called, didn't they? I'd already guessed <laughs> no. what happened. Do you know when you have like a really bad week where things go in your own, you like literally have the complete opposite of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was kind of, I don't know what they feel like, but <laughs> yeah. it's, been, it's been a little while. But, <laughs> but yeah. I think like we, we always get bogged down about times where we're unreasonably unlucky. Like we like you, you first, you stub your toe mm. and then like dinner doesn't go well because you've, you've burnt something. And then all of a sudden, like, your partner leaves you, someone dies, like, it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. But, like, we never talk about times we've been unreasonably lucky. Okay. So, what, where does luck come in, then? Because Do I, I, from an external point of view, I've always thought that you fully deserve where you are. Mm. Right? You, yeah. you seem to match the qualities that are needed for, to do what you need to do, where you're currently at. Yeah. Where does luck come in? But there's that old saying, like, you make your own luck. Sure. And I, I do I do believe that because just in terms of probabilities, mm -hmm. like the more chance, the more opportunities you create for yourself or the more positions that you put yourself in, the more opportunity there is for luck. Like okay. the whole point, yeah. in, the whole point, the whole, the whole premise on how I came here was that I went to Toastmasters, mm -hmm. I met Ash, and then it just happened to coincide that I had a summer where I was available yeah. and you were willing to give me a chance yeah. and I ended up coming here over the summer and that was because I took that leap of faith initially to go to Toastmasters mm -hmm. I think you're right it's, it's, it's a probabilities game mm -hmm. and for everything in life where you're never going to be able to make it to 100% guarantee that oh certainty yeah. but you can increase your probabilities but then to tip it over the edge that's where I think luck luck plays its part people call it luck you can call it whatever but i think there's something that inevitably tips over the edge um and determines where um what what outcome happens I, that's my opinion on it where, where do you see that yeah no i completely agree i think that really you should approach life as if you're giving a hundred percent but then the likelihood is if you're giving a hundred percent 50 percent will be given to you or maybe 30 percent, or something mm. will be given to you because You've earned it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a dangerous mentality, though. I think that's the mentality of, like, the world owes you something. Yeah, but you still assume you go in with 100%. Right, okay, yeah. As so long as even you... if you're not given yes. the you're fine. Yeah, you're always assuming 100%, yeah. but I think more than likely, you may just be given something. Yeah. Can I ask you two something? Because you two were once formally... You're, you're no longer a part of Toastmasters, are you? No. Okay. Are you still going? Are yeah. you still... Uh, you're, you're, you're still quite senior, a senior member? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, he's the OG. You're the OG. Um, youngest in age, but... <laughs> youngest in age. Very wise stuff. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, because that is like, um, let's call it an extracurricular activity. Mm. Growing up, I felt like I always had a very limited amount of things that I focused on, whether that be school and then like one extra thing. Or, I don't know, I, I never considered things like Toastmasters. I never considered things like... Um, 
outside to like advance me. Does that make sense? Mm. What motivated you both to go to something like Toastmasters? What about you, Ash, first? What, what made you want to go to like something like Toastmasters? Um, I look back at when I first registered for Toastmasters. Um, funnily enough, Jamie was there at the first meeting that I went to, and I, I was very inspired. I'll be honest, yeah. genuinely. Um, um, sorry, actually, what is Toastmasters? Because I hear yeah. I know so many Toastmasters uh, members. Jamie, can you give a, yeah. a quick definition? Yeah, and they all describe it in a different way. So, it's a non-profit organisation that helps people with their public speaking and leadership skills. Okay, cool. Yeah, and just quickly on that, how did you find Toastmasters? How did you come across it? Sorry. So I came across it because I was working in Cambridge for the first, my first sort of internship, if you like. And my manager saw me give a couple of presentations and said, like, you clearly enjoy public speaking. Mm. Like, why don't you go to Toastmasters and refine your skills? And it just happened to be that the day that I came back, there was a meeting. So I gave it a go. But also there's, so that's how I discovered it. And the reason why I went for it was because there are, there are three skills that everybody needs to be good at or, and always needs to improve on, but they never they, but they don't want to, and that is listening, reading, and writing. Sorry, no, that's not right. Reading, writing, and speaking. Okay. Or listening, writing, and speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, those, those sort of English skills that nobody wants to practice, nobody wants to get good at writing, no one wants to get better at listening, and no one wants to get better at public speaking. Yeah but they are the skills that are fundamental to almost everything else that you do. And I knew that, that this was an opportunity for me to improve a skill that most people don't want to improve. It was a, it was a, it was a, it felt like a niche in the market for my age. Yeah. Okay. You, what age? 19. Okay. I was thinking this was like 15. I was like, what, 15 no, no. year old is walking around with this level of wisdom? <laughs> no. no, but even, yeah. even at 19, you're absolutely right. Like how many, how many people are yeah. thinking, if I, if I can refine this skill now, it will serve me well in the coming years. Yeah. It's, it's hard to have that foresight, whereas you see people of a slightly older or mature age getting involved with it. And uh, it's not that it's too late then, but you, you wouldn't have had those many years of experience um, and refinement on that side. But going to your question of how I found it, um, mine wasn't a, a referral. It was more that... I've been told that, well, I, I always loved giving speeches back in the day, probably more so than, well, I still enjoy them, but I don't give them as regularly. Um, but like that kind of that public speaking mm -hmm. uh, mentality, especially at school and at university. Um, but the thing is, you're often, when you're surrounded by your peers, um, or you're like your friends, especially at uni, you, you know, they big you up. They, they say, oh, you're really good at, you're really good at public mm -hmm. speaking. So you start to think you're just naturally very good. Yeah. And it goes back to Jamie's point of, well, I don't need to, I don't need to work on it anymore. I'm already a very good speaker. And then I started to listen back to my speeches and, and I was like, oh yeah, I am good. But it took someone to be critical of me mm. in a way that were like, oh, you're umming and ahhing a lot, which Jamie will know about a lot from <laughs> my, my time at Toastmasters that I had to work on. How did you fix that? Because um, Ram always gives me grief when yeah, he's editing I, the podcast. I'm fixing it. <laughs> Sorry. It's still always a work in progress. But yeah. they, they, they were critical in a nice way and someone I really respected. So, uh, you know, everything they said, they were just like, you know, Ash, you need to work on this. If you really want to get good at public speaking, there are areas that you need to improve on. Mm -hmm. um, the clarity of my voice, um, certain things, the... The speech that I was giving was very long-winded and could have been refined. And again, something continuously working on in my written um, and in my speaking. And because they were critical for once in my life for that area of what I was doing, um, it made me like review everything I was doing, like looking back on the videos of me speaking and realizing actually, yeah, there were a lot of areas for improvement. And I guess it goes to the point that whilst it's nice to surround yourself by people that support you and help you prosper make sure there's a healthy healthy amount of criticism or critique in your life um to make you realize like you're not invincible and you're not yeah, yeah to humble you, you know, know. <laughs> yeah it's needed <laughs> um especially when you're you know you're making uh progress in in your life you need that need that humbling but yeah that's, that's where I, I already got it. And you meet some of the speakers at Toastmasters. Uh, Jamie will know. Jamie being one of them. Um, humble and quick. Uh, <laughs> but you meet some of the speakers and I was, I was in awe. I was like, wow, I thought I could speak. Yeah. I thought I knew what I was doing. But boy, do I have a lot to learn. Um, and even speaking now, it's making me think that I need to. I do need to get back into it uh, in one way or another. But we'll see. 
you're yeah. you're ever going to rejoin? I, I think I, I, really? I think it's a must. Yeah, when I when I think of even on a work basis, so I can see the direct return, right? Mm. Yeah. Because uh, when it's in your personal life, you think, oh, what am I going to do this for my my p- partner's fortieth birthday or something? Or <laughs> I don't know, or I don't know, like that. You know, that when, when this is going to be useful many years down the road. Mm, yeah. But with business, or certainly what we do, I can kind of see that sooner. Next week. Yeah, pretty much, right? (laughs) So I guess if I use that in my mind to say it will be beneficial for the business and also the direct return, uh, which is is visible, Mm. then I think it will get me to get up up and go. And uh, yeah, I I really need to work on that. So yeah, good. I think that's quite a lucky situation to be in, that skills that are so difficult to get better at and also have no normally have no direct return like you have a situation where you have a direct return mm. like for most of us we kind of want to improve public speaking yeah, for, yeah. for reasons we don't really understand but this is a situation where you, you know that if you learn to speak better you could achieve more clients or you could yeah expand your avenues whenever you're doing a webinar so why why can't that be a a benefit for most people in their roles or that? Okay, there are, I assume there are some people that don't don't I, get involved in public. Speaking. I think the difference here is that you're in the scenario, whereas um, for other people they'd have to manufacture these scenarios. Mm-hmm. I think here you can see a direct return, but if somebody who worked um, as a, you know in data or in a necessarily not necessarily a client facing role or not necessarily in a role where you have to present to a large group of people mm. you'd have to put yourself in that scenario you have to go out in like a group of people um, which actually um, I, I wanted to get your take on on something right mm. do you think I'm just trying to phrase this in a way to not get in trouble um, like social anxiety is something that can be treated with practice because I think that there is a lot of no I can't say that I think this but is there a possibility that um, a lot of people with social anxiety are being shielded by this term because there was a time when I was incredibly shy Mm -hmm. I have to look back at that I have to look back at times where I feel like I'm incredibly shy and I have to look now at myself in social circles and social scenarios where I am quite outspoken. Yeah. And there are people who tell me they get anxious in social scenarios. And I don't know how to react to that. I don't know how to say like, well, this might not be the environment for you versus just give it time, give it practice, mm. give it. What do you think, Jamie? I didn't understand the question. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll take, I'll take my Please take do. and then on that part. So I guess what you're saying is that if I were to say not social anxiety, but someone being shy mm. or being being there, you know, they're being more of in. Can you say that's introverted? Or more because I think they're very different things. So I'm going to yeah. say with the shy side, yeah. right? Yeah, because I yeah. the difference here. What yeah. I want to clarify is that an introvert might feel their social battery is depleted in yeah. certain environments, and I get that completely. Yeah. I feel that sometimes. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between an introvert and somebody who might necessarily be shy or sure. anxious in social scenarios. Okay, so I, I agree. Okay, um, if we just go to shy and whether that can be solved by uh, over time and um, an effort and working on it, I agree. Mm. Um, because again, I have been in that position. Mm. Um, certainly growing up at times, I'd go through phases, right? Um, but certainly when I was growing up at a younger age, I felt that I was a sh- quite a shy kid. Yeah. Um, not ridiculously shy where I was just to myself but certainly not the person that would be the most outspoken yeah. or out there mingling away so quick I was I was the guy uh, in the in class yeah. like I'd hide in the corner I wouldn't want anyone to see me or anything amazing yeah incredible <laughs> That's um, and yeah. really really surprising given every meeting we're in together um <laughs> But I, for me, I think it's a, and I think we, we've had a similar conversation in the past, um, Sam, but I think it's a very much a, if for me, a fake it till you make it scenario. Okay, yeah. Um, where when you, it, it does take breaking breaking that mold, right? Um, you know, in anything really, it's like, yeah, I've got to just give this a shot and feel what I'm doing. And in that situation, you, there's no one way of, fixing or resolving being shy and going straight to, oh, I'm going to be outspoken. Yeah. But at least you can 
pretend to be someone who is outspoken and certainly more confident, yeah. mm. uh, which allows you to see how people react to you being confident, mm. which may give you the confidence boost yeah. in order to, to break that, that mold, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, for me, it's the lack of reaction. I yeah. always expect someone, like, I don't know, in my head, I build it up so much. Expect someone to just go, how dare you speak? You yeah. have an opinion on this topic, mm. and then you say your opinion, and then you don't get that reaction. You're like, all right, I'm okay. I'm yeah. I can keep talking about this. And did that grow to you? So you went from really worrying about the reaction that you'd get every time you yeah you made a comment maybe you made i don't know the same class you yeah you were worried to say something in case someone goes what the hell are you talking about you don't yeah, know what yeah. you're talking about right did that go to as you started to build your confidence over time did that go towards i don't care what people say yeah what kind went, of yeah i went through a fake it till you make it phase yeah well you could argue i still fake it i don't think you ever know when that transition happens right but i went through um so like just saying jokes that dropped like lead balloons man. Mm. like i remember being like and it made me question myself like am i not a funny guy am i mm. not this kind of person and then you'd say that same joke in front of like your crowd your friends people who get your sense of humor and they would laugh and they realized like you can't put the blame on someone else but you just like different people need different things yeah and i'm most comfortable with my friends and i'll crack the most amount of jokes with my friends and they'll find it funny yeah um but ultimately when i'd make these jokes and nobody would laugh I'd feel like crap for a while. Yeah. And then I started to think, what actually happened here? Not much. Mm. I said, like, everybody moves on within five yeah, minutes. No one remembers that. Yeah, <laughs> in my head, it's been 20 minutes, an hour, and I'm just like, I bet they're still thinking, I'm, who's like, why did he say that? That's not funny. Yeah. Uh, but no, people have moved on. It's yeah. like, nobody's paying attention. <laughs> you know what's crazy for me is how confidence oozes, right? So when someone, when someone just walks in the room and they <laughs> show confidence... Yeah. Everyone feels it. Doesn't matter how he looks, mm. you know, or what he's feeling. But there's a sense of confidence that changes a, uh, someone's perspective on you. Um, and I see that with plenty of times where, uh, when I turn up in the best mode, the best mm. Ash mode, yeah. uh, it change. It can really change the dynamic of what's going on. Yeah, on that side. I think that can come back to the self-talk that you have in your head. Yeah. Like if you have bad self-talk the way you talk to yourself yeah then you beat down your confidence mm -hmm. but then if you're starting to build yourself up and you, you just like at some point you've you have to let go of waiting for somebody else to gas you up <laughs> yeah and you have to just start yeah. bigging yourself up and, and not like there's a fine line though there's obviously boosting your ego to a point where like you think you're invincible mm. yeah. but then there's the no but you have done this before mm. or you've you've solved a problem that you've never been able to do before so surely you can do it again and that's the mindset that I'm trying to get myself into now where like if I get scared of doing something I'm like well I've, I've, I've done stuff before like I've proven that I can figure something out yeah so why can't I do it again yeah and that comes back and I think that helps with confidence in a, in a situation like talking to people but the other bit that I wanted to say was I think, yes, you should throw yourself into those situations to improve your shyness. Mm. But I'd like people... It's, I look at this very mathematically, but I think we should treat shyness and social anxiety to an extent like people treat the gym. Okay. Or how they should treat the gym, which is like progressive overload. So, say, one week you talk to people like throw yourself into a situation for about half an hour mm -hmm. but then it's 35 minutes the next week 40 minutes the week after and like you can you can monitor your progress i don't like it though because sometimes you do just need to throw yourself in for three hours mm -hmm. sometimes you need to spend a day yeah. or you might not spend a week you might have a bad week but if we try to keep to that you'll see the progress over time mm -hmm. and there's that consistency to a point where in three years time you can see where you've progressed See, I really like that as a systematic approach. I think that's very smart. And this is where I have to say something quite controversial. Mm. And it's where I think terms like social anxiety, and this is not something that I understand that much. Mm. or It's not some, as a construct, I don't understand social anxiety well enough to make the statement I'm about to make. But I genuinely, I think a certain level of it is being used as an excuse. You know what I mean? Like, mm. <clears throat> 
you might be able to offer that advice to somebody of like, try it for 30 minutes, try it for 35, try it for 30. Sometimes you've got to throw yourself in for an hour. Mm. And it's like, I can't do that because mm. that's where I think I have my gripe with it. And I can't, I think with the, t- with specifically the term anxiety, you have to be careful mm. because I understand that fear and anxiety are very, very different things. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's something that I just, I get the impression trying to be as safe as possible that it might be being used as an excuse a little bit sometimes with some people yeah, yeah. it makes it makes a lot of sense yeah i um i think we've almost gone from a time where people it would be it was a bit too hard um mm. hardball where, with people that were shy and, mm. and had social anxiety where it's like man up, dude. yeah man up like what what are <laughs> you doing up. like you know get involved with everyone yeah. like grow a pair and all that <laughs> to going the other way where things yeah as you say could be veering on a bit over the top in mm. protecting those that aren't uh, you know th- th- there is this also a spectrum to social anxiety and i appreciate that and mm. again my my knowledge of that is limited but there are people on that spectrum that don't necessarily need to be wrapped in bubble wrap mm. but they are because of society protecting them uh, or trying to protect them from the world i feel that like we can we can we can combat that in a different way in terms of that we can we can be more open to trying different things to allow people who feel like that to be more involved. So there's a great question that I was asked re- that I heard asked recently, which is when some people go for interviews, mm-hmm. they now want to ask, what is it like being the quietest person in the room at your company? Okay. And does your company do enough to make that person feel included? Mm-hmm. And I think if we, as, well, obviously I'm, I'm not in the leadership position, but <laughs> like if, if you guys were to think of it like that, yeah. what can you do to make that quietest person to feel heard? Yeah. So this is a very interesting question, right? Because I do feel some responsibility in management to make sure that the people's voices around me are elevated, that everybody's position has been heard. And in those scenarios where let's say uh, we have a meeting, I've been in this scenario myself, I spoke about it two episodes ago, but I'm in a room where a a shy person doesn't necessarily uh, speak up or vocalize their ideas. Mm -hmm. Is it better for me to reduce like stop the conversation and ask that ask that person what their opinion is which is something that's fine by the way i phrased that a bit negatively that's absolutely fine Mm -hmm. is it better for me to do that or is it better for me to start throwing them in the deep end in some certain scenarios like you have to present in this meeting you have to do that long term is it not better to build their confidence up to match the volume of the people around them Mm -hmm. You see, like, this is kind of relating back to Ash's point of, are we overcorrecting in some manner of the word? Almost every time you calm the room in order for that person to speak, Mm. you're giving them a helping hand, which is great. Yeah. Where it seems great in the moment. What happens when you're not in that room Mm. and there is no one to give give that person a helping hand? You're right. They they have the potential to have not learned those skills to have got up on their own feet. Mm. In that respect. What are your thoughts on that? The initial thought was actually by stopping the... Com- like this, I don't agree with it, but by initially stopping the conversation mm. in order for that person to talk, are we stopping momentum of the conversation? Potentially. I don't know. Assuming, let's say, we're going around the room then. We've started yeah. this activity in order... Like, I know that the person sat there mm. is a quiet person. So instead of, like, waiting for someone to speak up, I go, let's go around the room and discuss it. That's my tactic to elevate their voice. Yeah. Assuming I do that, we can maintain the pace of conversation, I think. Yeah? You, so you think that solution is great? I think that's a good solution. But then the one thing you'd have to do is make sure that that person doesn't just say, yeah, that's fine. Mm. Or, I just agree. Because... May not, but they might need a little bit more, not probing, but the conversation needs to flow in order for them to feel comfortable then to then say what they really think. Mm -hmm. Because I think we can get quite, we we can get caught up in the, okay, let's get through all the people. If somebody says, yeah, that's fine, we just move on. Yeah. And like to an extent, you need to be like that because you've got stuff to do. We can't be here all day. Yeah. But at the same time, like that person might just need a little bit more time and time to settle into the conversation before they can go actually no I think we should do this yeah 
to me that's treating the symptom rather than the cause though that's that's sort of my issue with that mm. it's like um it's go on no no i uh, no no yeah I, I, all i was saying is are we uh are we contradicting ourselves go on. because one minute we're talking about progression mm. and how people mm. need to be eased in and develop the skills for that and then on the other we're talking about how we need to put people into the deep end and make them learn the skills on their yeah, own. I guess. I don't know. I just just it is it is there. a contradiction, but also um, it's also an opportunity to to actually practice this. But yeah, it, it, in some way or another, it is. I, I mean, there's no. I, I, I'm <laughs> yeah. stuck in the middle because yeah. really going back to the the analogy of being stuck you know, thrown in the deep end that happened to me as a kid when I was yeah. swimming, learning to swim. I'm sure yeah. it's happened to a lot of us, right? Yeah. Um, where I was making very little progress in my swimming. Mm-hmm. Uh, for whatever reason, I just wasn't interested and whatnot. Yeah. My mum took me to a new swimming lesson place in in a rougher place in 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 the in the world mm. uh for some reason or another i was <laughs> the pond in your car yeah, you know I'm with you, Ash. <laughs> yeah no I, I mean probably not that rough but at the time it was like whoa whoa, whoa this is not my comfort yeah. zone right this is not what i was brought up in um and i remember the teacher just just threw like not physically but just was like <laughs> going Tom in Brady. And, and this was like i was still quite young at the time um and boy did i learn how to swim yeah yeah, boy, boy, did I become a, a pretty, uh, pretty good swimmer. You're a good swimmer, now? I'd like to think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe a little bit out of practice, but yeah, absolutely. Um, used to do some galas and stuff, uh, but yeah. but boy, was I a poor swimmer back in the in the early days. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was that was just my analogy. So that's why I'm stuck in the middle because on one side, uh, I agree with the whole you need to you need to get it be dropped into the deep end mm. on the other i've seen the potential of progression you know mm. gradual improvements over time especially with something so delicate and attributed to one's personality yeah. um that needs to be treated quite delicately compared to a physical skill so i don't know i see both angles are we ready to interrogate jamie i think it's about time Go yeah on. okay because right. uh, i, I want to in the mood a little bit We've okay. been talking about anxiety, social. How did we end up here? How did we actually end half an hour? You, in? you brought us it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think. I do this way too much. No, it's okay. Where I try and think of the beginning of a conversation, mm. and I'll do it midway through a conversation with somebody, mm. and I'll forget what we're talking about. <laughs> and like I'll just have a blank face. I'm, some of my friends can tell when I've done this now. Well, I've just gone blank, and they're talk- we're talking about something, and I'm trying to like, how did we end up? That far back, and like, you've done that thing again, haven't you? And I was like, yeah, I have no idea where we're, what we're talking about. Let's interrogate Jamie. Okay. Jamie, we were at Bouldery recently, and mm-hmm. on the drive home, I told you that on this podcast, I wanted to ask you a couple of things, Go on. Um, and this is going to pretty much just put a spotlight on you. Mm-hmm. Oh, don't highlight the greys, man. The uh, actual spirit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. We're actually putting a spotlight on they're you. They're not greys, they're wise hairs. This wise is where the hair, wisdom's hairs coming of from. Wisdoms. Yeah. Youngest chap in here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you got a couple greys on you. I'm having greys since yeah. I was about 18. Really? <laughs> yeah. Have you um have you heard of a, a ammonia free beard dye? A hair yeah. dye? Hair dye. Yeah. Is anyway. your is your life stressful? <laughs> Genuinely asking, do you consider your life to be stressful? Yeah. No. No. I put stress on myself. Okay, cool. Um I mean not cool. But <laughs> is that not what? Is that what not? Is do most people not do that? Huh? Are our lives actually stressful or do we put stress on ourselves? True. I mean, there are definitely people out there with stressful lives, don't get me wrong. Mm, yeah. Like, def- well, deserve to have that. Yeah. But are ours? I don't know. Well, don't know I don't know if mine is. I definitely put a lot of stress on myself yeah. sometimes. Like, like when I'm just really relaxed and I'm just like, why was I so stressed last week? I was like, ah, because I made myself mm. that stress last week. Okay, we're ready. Wait, just before we do that, okay. Do you feel your your handling? Uh, do you feel you're handling stress better over time? For example, you you say you put a lot of stress on yourself. Mm. Did Jamie of today could he manage the stress of Jamie from last year far better than yeah. Jamie last year could? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Surely it's oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just mainly because I'm just focusing on balance now. Like mm. before at uni, it was. I will work from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. the next day, mm. like doing uni stuff. Whereas as life progressed, I realized that like, I can't just live like that. Mm. And I started to take care of my health and make sure I ate better, exercise more, 
did things that interested me so that I've got that overall balance to be happier and then therefore less stressed. Yeah. Oh. I think it's the, like a parallel increasing line of like your ability to handle stress, but also the complexity of your stress. Yeah. Mm. So that's why I think, yeah, Jamie of today can probably handle the stresses of 2019, Jamie. Yeah. But the other way around would, I don't know, for me, it would cripple me. So yeah. like 2022 stress on 2019, Jamie. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but then 2019 stress was final year of uni. Mm. And life's definitely not that stressful. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, Yeah. hit me. Okay, so when we were driving back from bouldering, Mm -hmm. I told you that I wanted to ask you a series of questions. Yeah. A series of outrageous questions. A series Mm -hmm. of outrageous questions that I asked Ash on the drive home from Deschum in Birmingham, which is an outstanding restaurant. I don't care what all the hype people (laughs) are. Like, too many people say it's hype, too many people. I get distracted. So, the questions are focused around the preposterous idea that you can pick your family. You obviously cannot pick your family. However... Assuming that before you were born, you were sat down with the almighty, the maker, whatever your beliefs are, um, and before you entered this earth, you were asked to pick your family. So break down your family tree for me. Mum, dad, sister. That's it. That's you you guys, all four of you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was your first question. I, I wanted to be in a family of four. Yeah. And then the question, let's say number one, why did, why did you pick your dad? Assuming you had the choice of like 20 fathers mm. and you saw your dad, what about him made you pick him? Quite a lot of things. Yeah. Firstly, his, the main one is actually his patience. Okay. Especially, and patience and democracy. So even though my, my, my dad in the past has had a bit of a temper, like he's learned now to be very patient. You know how there's that thing where like, if you're in, I can only go back to gym examples. If you've you've got long arms, bench pressing is hard. Yeah. Learning to bench press properly because you've got more area to go wrong. Yeah. Okay. It's the same. And therefore you work hard on it to then get good at bench pressing. Mm -hmm. Right. You overcompensate and you sort out your weaknesses and you make them into a strength. Yeah. Same thing in my dad. So now he's very, good at being patient when things blow up okay if there's an argument he'll be the like, voice of reason mm-hmm. and then also he's very good when it comes to democracy so say for example we're sorting something out and we've got an issue with somebody say in another family mm-hmm. and say my mom and my sister have one opinion i have another opinion my dad would always say like, we need all of you in a room to discuss it. Mm-hmm. So half the time I'm not in the house, like more because of work, they'll be having this conversation, say whilst I'm working, mm. but then he'll, he'll just say, okay, no, wait, we need to make sure we're all here to discuss this. Mm. And then we'll all sit down and we'll all discuss it and make sure everybody's opinions involved in the situation. And I think that comes from him being a project manager as well. Yeah. Okay. There's that understanding that somebody, no matter who they are, could come up with the solution so always try to take into account what everybody says your dad has said that to us he actually came down for a day and visited he said that word for word mm. the solution can come from anybody he yeah. used the school bus trapped under a bridge example yeah um have you do you remember this no i don't remember that analogy though. um school well, bus trapped under a sorry. bridge and um they got the finest engineers from all around the world. They tried to figure this thing out um, and it had gone in and it was stuck. Yeah. They were like, we can't lift the bridge. That will mess things up. We can't like, re- what can we do to the bus? And apparently one of the kids on the bus said, well, if you just let the air out of all of the tires, it will lower the bus and you could go it through. So anybody can go. The reason why he told us that analogy. Wow, that really stuck in there. Mm. I did not know why that stuck in there. <laughs> we still use that um, that thinking though. So today yeah. when, we, when we're discussing things, we're like, you know, we need to get more ideas from the entire team mm. uh, coming through. But yeah, um, yeah. Well, on the on the first one and also kind of the second one, but mm. mainly the first one, um, you mentioned how he probably pr- progressed over time. So he learned to become more patient. Mm. Do you value that even more as well as the fact he is patient? The fact that he learned to become patient? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah definitely overcoming any of what I call my weaknesses. Mm-hmm is something I've definitely learned from him where he's seen things in his life where he's not been happy about them and has done things about them 
to their form makers life better mm -hmm. I think that's a massive thing to learn um, just do me a favor and pull your mic a bit closer to you um, it's probably one of the best things to learn yeah. yeah in all things yeah it's a very powerful thing to realize that you can change well I, I genuinely believe we're limited in what we can change but mm. that is entirely our responsibility to change those things um, recently learned you know a lot of it is sort of chaos and madness mm. that you can't really control but there are a couple things within your realm that you can yeah um, moving swiftly on why did you pick your mother punctuality yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can attest to that. I've never seen you be late to anything, which is terrible because professionally speaking, I'm rarely late. On a personal level, I am terrible. And now that we hang out more on a personal level rather than a professional, I'm always letting you down. I'm very sorry. But you're improving yourself, Sam. I am you're improving, improving myself. myself. That's true. But you're surrounding it... yourself by people who are punctual. Yes. People who are better than me and fixing me up. But the amount of times where Jamie calls me and I'm in bed and it's like, dude, you're supposed to start bouldering 10 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, go on. Uh, punctuality. Yeah, punctuality, cleanliness. Okay. But also just doing things right. Mm -hmm. So in terms, of, especially for the punctuality side, like my mom's the person who will say, okay, we need to get here at 1, 8, 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. Therefore, at 11... 11 o'clock, we need to have prepared lunch to be able to have lunch at 12 and therefore go. But then before 11 o'clock, we need to make sure we've cleaned the house. Before that, everyone needs to make sure that they're ready and has stuff to take with them at 1 p.m. when we put, when, well, at 12.30 to put stuff in the car and then go. So it's just thought about all the different ways in which it's we should be prepared. Mean. Yeah. <laughs> why, why do you think she's like that? I think that's because Growing up, they had a, a news agent. Okay. And with that, she had to manage working at the shop and going to school at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So she knew that, okay, I need to wake up at four with my brother, go to the shop in the morning, sort out the papers. It's back then people read newspapers. Yeah, good old days. <laughs> and then saw all of that out before six o'clock to then come back have breakfast and then go to school mm. so she's always had that mindset where she's had to be organized and on time alternative she could have just been a terrible mother like there is an <laughs> alternative to this right like you're saying it like this was the only way she had to do this to make sure i mean the alternative is she's clearly not by the sounds of things but she could have just been terrible at <laughs> being also, this is weird. So you mentioned something about the personal and work and the difference in your punctuality. Yeah. And I completely relate to that. To okay, so I'm going to throw shade. But no, no, no. <laughs> I, I can't throw any shade on that because I feel the same sometimes. Okay. I'm like, yeah, at work, we're on time to our meetings and things yeah. mostly and everything there. But when it comes to personal, it's yeah. like, Everything's a bit here and mm. a bit airy fairy, and I like sometimes I like that because it takes us out of that routine. Mm. But there are sometimes even in personal things where I'm like, I just need to be a bit more like, I want, you know, when someone tells me to be there, I need to be there on time because I respect it when someone someone does it the other way. Um, and in your your mum's scenario, she kind of grew up having a blend of work and personal together, yeah, which forced her to be punctual in her personal mm. because her work had to be punctual. Yes. So that makes sense. And just really diving deep there, maybe that's what attributed to her just being punctual across the board. But yeah, I don't, she I'm not sure. Both. Yeah. How so. did you, how, well, to the best of your knowledge, how did your mum impart that knowledge onto you? Because getting things right is something definitely that my mum was like, mm. if she asked you to do something and it wasn't up to scratch, you heard about it. She was, a, my mum's a very powerful and very, not scary, but intimidating. I didn't, and like, it's my- She's it, not listening to this. <laughs> no, no, but like, I, you don't want to disappoint your mom, obviously, but yeah. my mom was somebody who was, as a, as a mother figure, mm. and I'm grateful for this, by the way. It's a very, I think, very optimal way to raise a child because she instilled some really good beliefs. Um, I don't know your mother, and I don't know if that's the kind of character she was, but how did she pass on those expectations to you? How did she impart that knowledge onto you? A lot of it was watching her do things yeah so watching her clean mm. like whenever she would clean up like everything's spotless afterwards and everything's done right yeah and 
say like even when when my mum works she works the hours that she works and she doesn't need to work like she'll be done at on the dot when she needs to finish because she's figured it out so that she can get everything done at that point and there's never been any complaints from her team her managers mm. she's just always done it right so I've always I've seen that in her but then also I think the way in which it was imparted on me I don't actually think was from was directly from her I don't think it was a she made it happen mm. it was that I don't want to disappoint my parents yeah growing up I just thought okay well, I was told I was I had talent at a young age in terms of academics. Mm. So I was like, well, I've clearly got a standard and I therefore, every time I go up a level, have to meet the standard. Yeah. And that's where I, that's the way I looked at it because if I wasn't meeting the standard, I wasn't doing it right. Okay. Which is a bigger problem in later life because like, I just get annoyed with myself for not doing <laughs> things right. Mm. <laughs> Even when I've never done something before and I'm just beating myself up about it. That's very interesting. I think I, I can relate to that. So do you remember certain scenarios where you were ever late to things? Yeah. And your mum would, would tell you off? Or she'd... Or did you do that before she did? Like, in your head, you're like, I can't believe I'm late. Is I she disappointed in me? Yeah, I've already beaten myself up. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how deep she got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, it wasn't her. And she's just like, my master plan worked. <laughs> <laughs> I got to him deep. Um, okay, cool. Why did you pick your sister? She might actually be watching, <laughs> so be careful. Uh, with, with my sister, there's, there are quite a few great things. Mm. The first is that, similar to my mum, she does things right. Yeah. Very particular. But also, I don't know how to phrase this. She... She's the most routine. No, actually, yeah, I kind of phrase this very well. She's the most routine person that I know. Like, you guys look at me and think I'm quite routine. Yeah, man. I am. Yeah. But that's because I've seen my sister yeah. where she is like clockwork in the morning. I don't have to worry at all. I know when she's showering. I know when she's going to the toilet. I know when she's going to brush her teeth. Yeah. I know exactly what she's going to do. Mm-hmm. And that means that she knows, ex- like, when it gets to say eight o'clock, she's done everything that she needed to do. There's no stress, no panic. Mm. I shouldn't get on with that day and that I've instilled in me and the other part is embracing other interests like okay. ju- not just academics mm. because my sister she's, she's still very academic but like maybe not to the extent that I am where like I properly went down my field she can just look at something new and go okay I'm going to do it and pick it up she mm. just picks up things very quickly yeah and I think I've always wanted to be like that therefore I've aspired to be like that and I can't be because I'm, I've not got that natural ability that she has but I therefore push myself to try and be like that mm. did that make any sense? yeah I yeah. think so be- because every and forgive me this is in no way shape or form directed at your sister mm. every family has one of those fuckers <laughs> Right? Yeah. For me, it's my brother and he fucking knows it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think every family has one of the... Is your sister older than you? Yeah. I want to take a wild guess and say it's the eldest. Is it the same with you? And Could your be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you know, yeah. Every family has one of those people. I think you can either take that in two directions. One, mm. which is jealousy, and I've seen that happen before. Mm. Um, or like I think the three of us took it of just like, I'm still willing to try my best to get to that level mm. because I know it will make me better. Um and like, yeah, just it, it, pu- it can either push you down or push you up. And I think, yeah, it can be very healthy sometimes. Do you think she got it from either of your parents? No. No. <laughs> That's all we need to know. <laughs> That's all we need to know. Um, and last question. Mm. Why do you think you're... Oh, let's go back around here. Yeah, why did your sister pick you? Oof. Oh. Mm. Oof, that's a yeah, I didn't. Thing. You know, I made that up on the spot. Really, freestyle. Because I didn't ask you this. When no, we no, no, no. That was exercise. that's fresh. Why did she pick me? Let's see that. Yeah, stop. See, this is the interesting thing, right? He's just spent the last fifteen minutes um, paying some like tribute to his family's best qualities mm. and they're like what's yours and it's just sheer silence yeah 
I it's think, very humble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very humble of you. I, know, I think I know what it is. Oh, go on. It's... I was wrong. A voice of reason. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah, I'll give you that. Like, I know I've said about my dad being the sort of a person of democracy. Mm. But I'm the person where if a discussion is happening and it's getting heated, I'm the person that will come in and say, hang on, like, we're, we're arguing for arguing's sake. Yeah. You're the diplomat in the situation. Yeah, I'm the mediator yeah. in that regard. And I'll just say, look, you've said this, you've said this, you're actually agreeing with each other. Or, like, what you're saying is, is actually unreasonable because if you think about this, mm. like, it doesn't matter. I'll be the one that comes in with a voice of reason, just, I, I can look at things a little bit more holistically in an, in an argument mm -hmm. and take a step back and go, like, half of this doesn't matter. Like, well, because I'm quite efficient. Hmm. I get, I do, it's a, it's a, it's a bad thing in a way. I get annoyed when conversations go down convoluted rabbit holes mm. <laughs> because I'm just thinking, no, you, you're going down there for no reason. Yeah. yeah okay. there, we've gained nothing from this. Mm. But obviously like in the height, in the heat of the emotion, like you do go down those rabbit holes. Absolutely. But when I'm sitting on the outside, I'm able to just see it all. And, but then I will make sure that we don't go down those rabbit holes because obviously you don't want to get to a situation where you're shouting yeah sometimes things need to come out but a lot of the time if you're if you're shouting because of misinformation say you've you thought somebody meant something yeah. something else yeah you've just shouted you've wasted 20 minutes for no reason yeah and you've made that person feel bad and yourself bad mm. so you're I think, at a net loss yeah, yeah you're at a net loss in your family Sam would you see yourself as the voice of reason <laughs> Out of the siblings? Out of the siblings? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, Think back to a, a scenario. Don't, obviously don't yeah, no, it. it's hard because in some scenarios, absolutely, but I definitely think that it's, uh, it's a responsibility the three of us share. Mm. I know it's a classic sit on the fence answer, mm. um, but I think um, like all of us are kids of divorce. So at some point, everybody's worn the hat of the mediator at mm -hmm. some point or another. So I've seen everybody do this. It's funny, somebody once described me as the mediator. There is a book called The Enneagram and it describes the nine different personality traits. And uh, I am a number nine, the mediator. Mm -hmm. And I got super defensive about this. It was really weird. I was like, no, because I have an opinion and I want to uh -huh. localize this opinion. Mm -hmm. And I've realized more and more that I, I am the mediator in a lot of scenarios. I do find myself in that situation, but there is actually a drawback to this where, and you kind of touched on this, but I have to pause the camera here and I hope I don't forget my point. There are some problems to being a mediator. And this is one that I'm, this is the existential crisis that I'm going through right now, mm -hmm. deep into my 26s, oh, yeah. which is I, I am the mediator in many scenarios and I've been in a lot of situations where I can see that somebody said something just to vent. I can mm. see somebody had it on their chest and they just had to release it. And it triggered that reaction. It's like what you said of like, you, you, you just said that because you needed to say it. Or you, uh, this conversation is going down a rabbit hole because this person expressed how they felt. Mm. And having seen enough of that, I don't tend to express how I feel. Like I do tend to suppress it because in my opinion, that's optimal. Mm. I very rarely yeah. express how, you know, like it's weird because I'll see an argument in my family. I won't say who or who, but I'll, I'll observe that argument. And I'm like, this whole argument could have been avoided if you didn't say that. Yeah. yeah. Did you need to say that? Yeah. And in reality, yes and no. So what you're saying is sometimes things have to be said, even if they're tough to take. Yeah, but I very rarely say them. Yeah. I very often play the role of the mediator, and that's left me in scenarios where I actually, A, I don't know where I stand on certain topics, mm -hmm. but also like, yeah, I, I feel like I have the right to these opinions, but I don't say them. And it's weird, because I almost have the conversation in my head, mm -hmm. right? I'll be, I'll be sat in the car with like my dad, and he'll say something that I disagree with. And I could go, well, I could tell him I disagree. I could, I could express my opinion here. And if I said that, he'd say this, and then I would say that, and then this would go there. All right, cool. And I would never say that to him. He'd never know where I stood on the mm. topic. And I'm, I don't know what the complications of that are, but I'm very worried about them. It's really weird. I've never worried about them. I've thought, I've, I've walked around this earth for 26 years thinking I'm right about this. 
but you don't need to have the argument. You can avoid it. This person doesn't need to know your opinion because all it will do is, is cause a fight. Mm -hmm. But then I look back to like past relationships and I've always been told that like, oh, I, I don't know how you feel about this. I don't know, you never expressed this, you never expressed that. And I'm like, ah, oh. mm -hmm. the, the, the consequences, alas, <laughs> they have revealed themselves. So yeah, I do find, but I think all of my siblings have been through that. So we all tend to play the mediator at some point. Interesting. I sometimes, uh, the reason I ask that is again, going on the sibling where you are a younger or older sibling, mm. uh, my, um, my thoughts originally, but you said, as you said, you share it with all your siblings, it was that the younger sibling tends to, in some cases, be the diplomat of a situation. Mm. Um, and my thoughts for that were because growing up, you, you see your family developing and you're mm. growing up, mm. but you're sometimes of too young an age to have an opinion mm -hmm. and to be able to voice it eloquently. Yeah. But what this does is it forces you to be the listener yeah. in a situation. Yeah, okay, very smart. So yeah. you grow up, and I, I felt it growing up. I even remember situations where I, for some reason I never said anything, but I was listening to everyone, yeah, yeah. watching everyone's expressions. I mean, family to family is right, seeing the argument, seeing oh, yeah. everything, and you're just sitting there in the corner this could have easily been avoided and you just see it mm. escalate and escalate. And certainly when you're really young, yeah. you can't even stop it other than cry, I guess. But yeah. other than that, you've got no, no real um, thing. And especially if it's a, a medium argument, there's no, there's nothing else you can do. And seeing that and escalating it probably makes you overanalyze or analyze situations, situations in that way. Uh, and I feel it. And maybe in other parts of my life now, I, I start to look for trigger signs. I'm like, all right, the war the room's heating up a little bit. Mm. Not to suppress it because sometimes a healthy discussion is is needed. Mm. But when it when it feels like this is being counterproductive, as you as you're saying, Jamie, then you're like, right, this is this is where this could be avoided, and we we don't need to go down that rabbit hole as such. Yeah, yeah it's just a thought. I can see the consequences though in other people far more than I can see it in myself. Mm. Like I can watch tensions fester and build for like six months and i'll remember the moment that somebody first avoided a topic you know like i can see that and i can see the consequences of um those two friends not talking or those two things like not expressing that one thing mm. and then you're like six months down the line you're all hanging out and you're like oh there's still tension because of that yeah but within myself i yeah. can't see it at all i'm like yep yeah, we avoided that argument happy days let's move on to the next thing and i can't tell like i've started to realize the power of like certain things affecting me subconsciously now mm. of like I'm acting towards this person not consciously but subconsciously I'm keeping this person at arms somebody actually highlighted to me that I kept them at arm's length for a really long time I didn't even realize it in my head I'm like yeah you're super affectionate you're super open and exposed with this person but I'm starting to realize like yeah it it affects me on a level I'm not even aware of yet and I think that's what ultimately scares me the most about this sort of thing there have been times where yeah, like in maybe relationships or friendships where I am very vocal and that person's very vocal but I'm quite grateful for those friendships because I always know where I stand with those people mm -hmm. so sometimes it is needed but it's not my natural go-to mm -hmm. I almost need them to start a fight so I can continue it yeah I think that's a lesson that I've learned quite early or well, not learned more recently in the mm -hmm. last couple of years that I don't want to go through friendships or relationships anymore where we don't nip things in the bud quickly. Mm -hmm. That's why I do have this mentality of if there's an issue, we're solving it now. Yeah. Like, I I will n I will not have an argument over a text. Yeah, yeah. If there is if if there is an argument happening in a group chat or one to one, I'll say no, call me. Mm, okay. Because I'm not having that. Because one, like you're gonna lose like body language and your vocal tone, like all of that is gone. Yeah. And people will start arguments for no reason and like we're not like this is just blowing out of proportion for no reason mm -hmm. and that's why i think if you have a phone call or you meet up in person like just solve it or at least like reduce it because it can be reduced mm. what do you mean reduced that's interesting because you may get to a point where you do still disagree yeah but at least you understand that you disagree with one another mm-hmm and then in the future, you can then get to a point where you resolved it. But you might just initially go, actually, yeah, we disagree. We might need to take some time out and think about it. But you can come to that decision together, not a, 
oh, they've said this, I'm not going to speak to them for six months. You think you can have a contrasting opinion with a friend and still be friends? Yeah, 100%. Do you think it changes how you treat them, though? It depends on the opinion. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah. There are some core, core opinions that yeah. can yeah. cause clashes, but there are opinions that can just make you you widen your perspective on things as well. Yeah. Which you need, right? Mm. In some cases. Yeah, I think that's true. But I think if, you, if there are those situations where you don't agree with somebody and it's, like like you say, down to your core, like you, they, they, agree, they disagree with something that you believe so strongly about or it's like one of your core values that they say, no, that's not... Right, like say say some say somebody said to me, "Oh, like I think murdering's good." Like you think I'm, that's good? <laughs> murdering is. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> then, like you, all of you're going to distance yourself from that person because they have completely <laughs> gone against your core value, and you yeah. should. Yeah. Like, don't waste your time trying to. Well, I don't know. Like, do you waste it? Do, do you put time in to figure that out? Murdering? No, I don't know. Probably no. Probably no. Extreme. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah. A little bit less extreme, yeah. or quite a bit less extreme. Um, I think that's right. Uh, yeah. You. I think it's good to. It's healthy. I don't know if we had an example. Mm. Um, it would. Yeah. It's. It, I think it's healthy to learn the reasoning behind someone's mm. opinion. Firstly, for you, if you just want to widen your your perspective on things. But also for that other person to appreciate that you've taken the time to to understand their opinion, mm. and I think that matters more than anything. That say I have opinion, murderings in my head, so we need to get that out <laughs> of my head and go go for something like I don't know. Not working late with you tonight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, work life balance. Mm. You think work life balance is is really important? I think that work life balance is is uh, all right. You can you can deal with not having it. Yeah. say that's our opinions and they differ right i'm not saying that's my opinion yeah. by the way yeah. um so say we had them and they they differed you can either reject my opinion and say yeah that ash you're you're completely wrong like, mm. i don't want to hear it or you could choose to understand my opinion yeah and then give your your voice on it you know? but that appreciation of my opinion allows us to to still remain as friends yeah um whereas if you were simply rejecting my opinion it would be very difficult to ever have it have yeah any communication then if i rejected it then i'm not somebody you should keep around anyway because that means that i'm not open enough to understand yeah, yeah. And i think that's like understanding where your line in is line is in terms of the people you want to keep around especially once you've left school left uni or wherever wherever you've gone down you get to a point where you can't try to make and keep friends with everybody. Yeah. You need to have a cut off point in the nicest way because otherwise you're wasting your time with some people where you could be spending more time with the people that you care about or people who would challenge you, but still like you get along with enough to keep them around. Mm. And I think sometimes we can spend a little bit too long keeping people around for when, when you disagree with them to the core. Yeah. I think or it depends not open on enough. Sorry, that was the other bit. That they're not open enough. That they're to... not open enough. Yeah, that's a yeah. big deal. But I think also um, depends what united you in the first place, mm. right? Because if it's if it's sport, right? Let's say it's Formula One, because mm. you and I sometimes get together and watch Formula One. I don't think it matters that you disagree on that, or if they like reject your opinion on that. Mm. If that's what your if that's what the nature of your friendship is, they're coming around on Sunday to watch the Grand Prix, and then you go your separate ways. I think that's okay. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think in terms of your core friends, the people who you speak to on a regular basis, the people who influence who you are as a character definitely need to be just as open as you. Yeah. Um, I Did you have anything from your list that you wanted to talk about? Because we got, I don't know, we, we've just crossed the hour mark. Um, so we Am could I wrap. to look at my list? Yeah, 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 you're allowed to look at your list. I'm thinking it would be fun to wrap up for 10 minutes. What, is that the time? Yeah, man. Um, it is the time. I asked a question about being reasonably lucky. <laughs> this one's quite... Well, it's not a quick one. Mm. I haven't got a quick one, actually. They're all, they're all like big rabbit holes. Mm. The two that I wanted to ask was... Oh, one second. Mm.
Bark at them. <laughs> Ruff! We have a Rottweiler in here. <laughs> Your little space guys aren't going to know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Are they not scared of Rottweilers? <laughs> No, they're not. They're the most harmless little kids. Oh, I see. I'll go and bark at them. <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah. Um, I'll do what I need to do for the podcast. I Jamie. just think of that dog. Have you seen that dog video? That dog man. Yeah. yeah. Came bounding yeah. over. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Yeah, go on. What you got for us, Jay? I don't know. I uh, know. Uh, this one's a nice one, actually. This one's a simple one. Mm hmm. What is something that makes you authentically you? Ash, apart from your biceps, what is something that <laughs> makes you authentically you? <laughs> of course, you put. Um, what is something that makes me authentically me? Is that right? Yeah. It's when I... I don't know if this is cop-out, or, but this is genuinely mm. what I'm feeling. Um... It's when I genuinely stop caring about what someone thinks about me when I'm doing that thing. Mm -hmm. That's when I'm really authentically me. What thing? Like as an example. uh, Bollywood dancing. Sick. Cool. Yeah. Like I I love, I love dancing. I love Bollywood dancing, but you've never seen me Bollywood dance because... I'd love I, to at some point. I, I, hold back. I don't know if I'm good or no, not. But I'm no, authentic. The reason why I want to see you dance is because I don't understand the concept of liking dancing. Mm-hmm. Right? I don't see the the joy of it. And that's just a me thing, by the way. Like, to the point where I want to... I've told you this. I want to sign up to, like, salsa classes. Yeah. So that I can truly see whether I like dancing or not. Because I don't get it. Yeah. If I give my reason for why I like Go dancing, ahead, is do. certain kinds of dancing, right? Yeah. Um is because I love music so much. Okay, and cool. I find it the only way to immerse myself beyond just listening to it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's, I, I that's respect my kind that. Of thinking. Take yeah. me some, uh, take, take, take me some, yeah. yeah, man, yeah. we'll do it. it genuinely. I need to understand, like, it's such a big deal. Let's do that. Let's, is it just a walk? Take me yeah. dancing. Why don't yeah, you take me I'm dancing, getting, dude? You want to, you going? Yeah. yeah. Should we go dancing? There's a lot yeah. of places. Uh, we are, like, there is are it? a lot of good places, yeah. yeah. Like, classes, we could try it. Yeah, cool. I'm game. Let's do it. Like I said, by the way, don't expect anything of me, but yeah. I do enjoy it. Anyway. Yeah, but you shouldn't care. Go, okay, Sam. Yeah, you don't care about what I, I think don't. of you. Can I tell you what I think of you, though? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> this is our show. Here we go. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that I think that another thing that makes you authentically you is the focus that you have. Yeah, man. Yeah. Like, like you, you can be that guy that just, that like, I don't know if you put headphones in or not, but like. He doesn't. That's the crazy yeah, thing. That, that, that's crazy to me. Like you can just push everything away mm. and focus on something for a couple for hours. Yeah. And I'm struggling to do that for like it's more than 10 minutes now. Yeah. And that is literally everything, by the way. That's sometimes even me like, yo, Ash, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely nothing. He does always get back to me, but yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, it, it can is... be offensive in some situations, but yeah. Ah, if, yeah. if you know you, then it's fine. Yeah. But yeah, that I, I have to agree with that a lot. That was me knocking. I have to agree with that. Like, Literally just now, you were setting up these reports because you wanted, like, these are um, staggered reports. They're, like, uh, at intervals. It captures data at intervals. And you were just like, it's Friday. It's half five. No one else here. And you're like, I have to do this because I want to capture the data over the weekend. Yeah. And it's I can see that in a lot of different things where I'm, I think I'm like you, where it's, like, 10-minute space. or so like, we have to use all these tools, like mm. the Pomodoro technique, scheduling, yeah. all of this stuff. If you put your mind to something, you do it. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we're not productive. We're productive as fuck. Mm. But you can really just do it. Yeah, that's what, yeah, really nice, nice thing um, that I hadn't really noticed. And I, yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't think I've always been like that. No? No, not at all. And I, I think I've got a long way to go with it because mm. I'm critical of my my focus at times. Mm-hmm. Um, although, you, you obviously, given that, that feedback. Um I think one of the things there is that I I punish myself when I get distracted from what I was achieving. I kind of punish myself, especially if we, we go to when I was, I was talking about the reports that we were just doing. And I'm like, yeah. right, I've come in here. I've mm-hmm. come to do this. Mm-hmm. If I don't get this done or even get to a certain threshold, then mm-hmm. I've just wasted my time. And then it'll take me. It goes back to something you always raised to me of like, that it'll take me another 
half an hour to get back into the swing of things yeah, probably yeah, yeah. longer when i pick that up on monday morning yeah and by then i've got another 10 things to do yeah. uh that have accrued in my way so yeah do you play a sport great. growing up or do you play any sports yeah yeah so yeah play cricket a lot cricket. Uh, football yeah did you ever set yourself those weird targets of like i can't go home until i've like at practice like yeah. basketball like i gotta make five layups before like in a row before mm. i go home do you do that to yeah, yourself yeah oh yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's yeah definitely and uh I don't know why I did that. That was, it was pretty stupid. Like you set yourself no, I, personal challenges. Not stupid. I think ineffective to what you think it's going to do. Right? Yeah. It's not going to mean you can always bang out five layups whenever you want. But it does make you better at layups. Yeah, I guess I guess I just like having those achievable targets. I, yeah. I never thought I was that person, to be honest. Yeah. I never thought I needed targets, but I guess naturally I set them. Yeah. I think we all do to a certain extent, right? Yeah. yeah. How about you, Sam? Uh, I'm going to give a cop out answer because there's a lot of uh, stuff, a lot of variables um, like battery, battery. Yeah. Um, it's my laugh, right? And it, it's not uniquely me because do you know what somebody recently told me? Different charger. I already checked. You, somebody, no, I told myself this. I realized this. You guys, either of you watch Killing Eve? No. Oh, damn it. Um, I have, I, I laugh the same guy as the fat Russian assassin. <laughs> He laughs like that. Yeah. Um, and that is exactly the same. Thank you. That is the exact same laugh that I have. And that's what makes me uniquely me. Yeah. Uh, what do you got, Jamie? I love that Ash got the charge and I still got away with having a cop. No, answer. that was a, t- a two cop answer. I'm trying to think of what makes Sam uniquely Sam. Sorry. Yeah, but you, that's what I was still yeah. thinking. Oh, about. I so see. Was, but no, f- f- for me, it's, it's similar to Ash, but it's your drive but your drive is different to Ash's drive very different so you will for you in in a problem sense that Ash is like I'm going to get bang out this piece of work and it's Mm. nothing's going to stop me Mm. you're a there is an issue Mm. and I will solve it and I will solve it today or I'll come at least come up with a plan to solve it in the next few days yeah i th- yeah i think it's bigger than that so sam goes on about this sometimes that he sometimes he's like, ah, i'm not bigger picture thinking i need to be more bigger picture thinking he is very bigger picture thinking mm. he just doesn't realize it so you'll have you'll be thinking about something some some little thing that happened in the warehouse that really annoyed you mm. but you won't openly say it mm. but it'll be tinkering away with him for a little while i see it all the time in various parts of the business uh, and and so on and I didn't he, know you knew this. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll tinker away or play away at him, mm. and then he'll come to me and he's like, "Ash, this needs to be solved," and it will be a it will be a whole process. And he's like, "Yeah," and he he he'd, he'd already have a bit of a plan and a sketch mm. together, but over time he'll be like, "Right, it's not this issue that needs to be resolved, but it's all the foundations underneath it that he's going to fix up." I see it time and time again, and it's just an area that I can't I. Just don't have that vision to realize that it's the entire process is behind you that. Don't. <laughs> no, trust me, it's, it's you're very incredibly process driven, um, yes. and he f- resolving all those processes to to fix that one error, and it also fixes about fifty other errors underneath. So, Excellent. yeah, it's but you you are that person, right? It does tinker away, it plays away. He's got five errors in his head right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to steal that answer. I'm very grateful that you said that because I think of everything in a process. I don't like, uh, I call them band-aid fixes. Mm. Um, I don't like to just put a band-aid, duct tape, mm. sorry, not band-aid, but that band-aid's better. I'm going to start saying that from now on. But I, I like uh, I like processes. I like things fist, fixed systematically. I, mm. don't think, I don't like things going wrong a second time. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank and you. sorry, just the final cherry on top there. I think Ooh. you're willing to put in the, the absolute effort and what it takes to, to get to that point. There's a reason why people do the band-aid solutions, mm. myself included sometimes, because we just haven't got the time to resolve <laughs> that, you know, just stick it on um, and it'll stop the bleeding. Whereas you're, you're like, right, I'm going to dedicate everything to it. But Thanks. yeah, let's focus on Jamie now. Similar as to what I gave about why I think my sister chose me. Yeah. Just a voice of reason and a voice of someone who considers as much as possible. Mm. So even like when, so I've got a trip coming up with my friends from uni Mm. and there are 10 of us going, but I've considered everybody's budgets 
mm. everybody's location. So I've figured out, okay, you're coming from here, you're coming from here, you're coming from here. Mm. How is everyone going to get there? Broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, that, you know, yeah. obviously everyone's coming with different budgets, mm. people are coming from different places, some people prefer different things. So like I've, I created polls for the different restaurants we're going to mm. go to for lunch and dinner. Then for the musical, we're going to see giving people the different options of being able to pay a pay a premium for a better seat or then saying, oh, but if you don't want to, there are some great seats here as well. So trying to consider everybody's understand everybody's stance and then also saying, oh, if you want to stay over, you can stay over. I won't be staying over, but if you want to, you can go to this hotel or this hotel. Mm. So I'm quite good at considering what everybody thinks and then putting something together that's good for everybody. Like, yes, I, you, you can't please everybody. No. And I fully understand that, but I'm going to do my best to get 70%. Mm. Have you ever had this thought about James? I've had this thought about you um, before, and I'm very curious now because it ties in beautifully to what you just said, but it kind of changed my mind a little bit. Mm. You're a fundamentally good person, I feel. I don't know you well enough to say that. You could mm. murder children on the weekends. Who knows? But <laughs> Why is it always to murder? <laughs> I don't know. You guys put it in my head. Um, but I have thought that um, if a large group of people were similar to you, mm. each influence, like the, the, in a large group of Jamies, you'd all influence each other in a positive enough way to elevate one another. Mm. And now I've made, it's what you've just said, I've, I've just made me realize, actually, you'd make a very strong diplomatic leader. In terms of the considerations of everybody, I'd cons- the way I'd thought of you is if you put a bunch of Jamies in an environment, that environment would become incredibly strong, intelligent, and very like incredibly well functioning. Mm-hmm. Like put a bunch of you on an island, and you'd have that that island would advance in humanity way quicker than you know this island that we're living on at the moment. Mm-hmm. But in actual fact, from what you just described, because you know my island of Jamies, that fantasy can't really come to reality. Um, but you leading a group of people, being as diplomatic as you are, mm. but also recognizing you can't please everybody. I think that would be a very strong thing for you. Would you take a position in politics? This this conversation has been coming up a lot around the office. I think I can't remember what you said. I, I wouldn't. But would you take a position in politics? Initially, no. Okay. But like, there has always been a small part of me that thought there's that's thought that there's a responsibility for me that I should. Okay. I don't know if that's ego. Or like just smoke Maybe. being blown up my backside. Like, where does it come from? Like, just, like, the I'm, responsibility. It, it, uh, respons- oh, that's that's a different rabbit hole. Okay. <laughs> but I've always felt that responsibility for the people around me, mm. especially my friends growing up. I was thinking, okay, like I'd need to make sure that they've all done their maths homework, mm. or they understand X or Y when it comes to academics. And then later on, it was make sure I'm helping my friends with their CVs and interviews so that they get jobs. Mm. I've felt that responsibility to make sure that one, I'm paving the way and showing that if I can do something, you can too, but also then helping them do their own thing. Mm-hmm. I just felt that responsibility to yeah, take care of, take care of my people. Yeah. <laughs> On that, that's so the, the part that came for me was yeah, the, the caring nature. Mm-hmm. And I don't just mean that's oh he cares about people. It's like, you're willing to, to again, put in the dedication to learn more about someone or mm. understand more about someone to help them with their, whatever they're going through or if they need, if they need help or, or assistance with anything. I've, I've noticed that with myself um, and, and things we do here. And yeah, rather than just superficially looking to get to know someone, mm-hmm. it's a much deeper, deeper outlook. And I think that all goes, ties in with your, you being able to win people over with your energy um, in a different way and yeah whether politics is the career for you down the line or not that's that's to be seen but yeah, yeah. look forward to saying that it'll be a lot it'll be a lot of work yeah <laughs> that's the bit that scares me the most but uh, maybe one day maybe one day oh. yeah when has that stopped you yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, on that note Ash do you want to yeah, shall so, we end things I guess We've that was a, a few circles that was a fantastic episode guys and uh, yeah thanks for listening to everyone who made it to this point in the episode uh, this was episode 22 uh, if you enjoyed it please be sure to like subscribe do everything you can share it with people as well share it with your friends family anyone you can um, you may want to murder yes potentially potentially not um, but yeah 
Uh, be sure to also comment and let us know what you want to hear next, who you want on. Would you like Jamie on again? Uh, of course, we'd love him back on as well. So uh, yeah, take care and uh, see you next time. Thank you.